Uh, please turn to Revelation 3, um, 14 to 22. Um, and let us remember that uh, the word of the Lord is true. So after the reading of the word of the Lord, we say that's the reading of the word of the Lord and praise be to God. It is just his word and praise to his holy name. And so let us do Revelation 3, 14 to 22. Um, the Bible says this, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do and that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor and blind as well as naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich, also buy white garments from me, so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes, so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. That is the reading of the word of the Lord. That is the reading of the word of the Lord. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen. Uh, may we kindly have our seat. Uh, thank you so very much for being here today um, and having our wonderful children and young people together in this service as a family service. And uh, so sometimes when it's family service, you expect a few things here and there. As Wema was saying, no, dad, you can't drink that alone. I must be partaker of the same. Abona Sifiwe Sana. I'm blessed of the Lord and I'm grateful for his grace and favor. Now we, we are talking about the danger of apathy. And uh, the portion of the scripture we have read, I'm going to divide it in three portions. Um, and the first portion will talk about the earthly positioned person. And the second portion of the same scripture talks about earthly spiritually positioned person. And the third one talks about heavenly or kingdom positioned person. Now, what is apathy? Um, I have a teacher in the house who really had to do a bit of pressure for me. Do you understand uh, this wonderful English? Because I took you from a village and I was a town girl. Uh, I know she's out there taking care of the little one. But as if you were. And so apathy is behavior that shows no interest or energy, or someone who shows unwillingness to take action. You are unwilling to take action. You are not enthusiastic about something. You have no interest. You are lacking in some energy towards what you're supposed to be getting. But now in this portion of the scripture, we are going to find that God was telling the church of Laodicea, you have become lukewarm. You are lacking energy. You are lacking passion. You are lacking enthusiasm to the things of God. And uh, we'll see why he was talking about the things of God. And you know, we just need to be energetic and enthusiastic for the things of God because he has positioned us and called us to be so. Now, Laodicea Church sat between other two cities, and that is Colossae as well as uh, Hierapolis. Now, in Colossians, you find Colossians 4.16, Paul says you can also read the letter that I had written to the Laodicea church. So they were neighbors. Said you can also get the letter, and the letter you do Colossians, you also give to the Laodicea church. And then Hierapolis was the city that was also near them, and um, where Laodicea city was, was somewhere in between the two cities. And Laodicea was such a positioned city that it was a wealthy city. And uh, every kind of, it was a trade route. And it was very wealthy. And they had all that they needed. And that's why the scripture talks about they said they are rich. They, didn't, they need nothing else. 
They were strategically positioned. They were a city that they were flourishing. And something beautiful was happening. It was a transiting city. But again, there is something that this city was not able to understand. And that is what Christ wanted the church to know. That they had talked about the city and they had forgotten about them becoming the church they ought to become. So the Bible says, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Now one thing you realize, when they talk about writing to the angel, they are basically, other Paul's letters were written to leaders of the churches, trying to sort out a few things. But in Revelation, you find that the spirit of the living God is saying, I'm writing to the angel of the church. I'm writing the message because angels are messengers of Christians. So I'm writing this to the Christian. I'm not writing to a congregation. I'm not writing to a gathering of some people. I'm writing to the believer. And that's where the Bible ends by saying, anyone who hears what the spirits say, let them hear and do what they're supposed to do. So this city had lacked one thing. They didn't have water. They didn't have uh, basically uh, sources of water that were right or that were natural. The city of Laodicea used to get water from Hierapolis and in west of Turkey. That's where it is today. And the water spring from there were hot springs. Now the Colossian city or the Colossae city on the other end, had the water flowing from there to Laodicea City, and the water flowing from Colossae was cold water. The water flowing from Hierapolis was hot water. So what happens when hot and cold meet? Become lukewarm. And so this city had built dams, and large dams, so that they can be able to collect water from both cities. And again, what happens to stagnant water? It gets bacteria, it gets a lot of things because the outflow is somehow little, but the water is too much stagnant in the dams. If you go to dams in this country, you will find all the kind of bacteria or the kind of um, uh, you know, plants and stuff like that. It's not a, such a beautiful place. Now, that is what Jesus wanted to draw the attention of the church to because the church had their attention to their positioning within the city. But then says you are like lukewarm water that is just within your city. You are not becoming the light. You are not becoming what you are supposed to become as God calls you. So the danger of apathy is it makes you the things, lack of enthusiasm to the things of God. They make you miserable. They make you poor. They make you blind. They make you naked. And that's why the Bible says you say that you are rich. Everything I want, I need nothing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. Why? Because you are looking at yourself with the positioning of the flourishing city, not in the positioning of you as a church. So you are just enjoying that which is happening. When you read in Romans 3.17, it talks about ruin and misery, characterize the lives of people, and talks about the law right there and talks about that there were even people who just say the law says this so we are comfortable we are okay here and that was something that Paul was talking about but then he says your lives are characterized by ruin and misery the danger of apathy that some it makes us poor miserable blind and naked but we don't realize it why you know sometimes we look at the things of the world and we look at them and we feel good about them because they are awesome and we are well positioned. For example, a question to us this morning. And, and, and we are sitting in a beautiful, beautiful church. Is it ever beautiful? What I see fewer. Isn't the works of this church awesome? But ask yourself, what are you doing after sitting here? So you are in this beautiful place. So then. So then. Yes, it's beautiful. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But God, you know, that the same kind of church, they were in the world, they had beautiful things, but inside them, they had no effect in the kingdom of God. I mean, when God looks at them, he just sees them living in a flourishing city, living as a church that is enjoying everything around the city. But in the spiritual sense of everything, these are just earthly positioned people. 
they identify with those things. And so they look at them and they find it. Some of us, of course, we have good cars. And when I mean good cars, I don't mean four-wheel drive vehicles. I could be having like my smaller one. It's a good one. I love it. You know? But, but then after driving that good car, then after having it, am I having any effect in the kingdom of God? After having that vehicle that identifies me, that positions me from this to this, from here to there, from all the holidays and other things that I want to do, what is God saying about it? Has that become my sense of belonging as opposed to me using it for the Christian purpose? What as if he will? Most of us, and we have children right here, most of our homes right now, even when you read the stories of Safaricom and other fiber uh, people are talking about how they have connected more homes. You know, we are ended, we are, we are just about to become, of course, we are an IT people, we are growing every day. But we have TVs, we have, we have those TVs that are connected to Wi-Fi, and your children are proud about it. Actually, what to sensors, walikuwa nakuliza kama uko na Wi-Fi, na kama TV yako ni digital, ama ni smart. Even the government wanted to really understand where you are. You know, and, and our children are there and they are getting excited about the TV and about all the things. But what do they watch? What, what is their reference to the wealth and to the blessings you have in your home? Is it making a change? You realize whether it's making a change when they go out to play because they're going to talk about wrestling that they are watching right there. When they're out there, they're not going to talk about, oh, Paul, I can, can I even pray for you? Can I do something? Because they were watching something right there and they are just identifying with the world. You know, sometimes you can even hear how we identify with the places we come from. Some of the schools we go to, you, in the introduction, when we are within our homes, we also have children, you know. And, and they are there, and what's your name? And they will say their name, and they will say which school they come from, and they will say which church or which teacher is, and they will even say the motto of the school. And you can tell, of course, your shule ata motto yake, Moto Moto Shule. You know what I mean? It's a beautiful school. It has an identity. You know, that school is not a simple word. School. They have even taught their pupils how to identify with the school. Yes, it's okay. But then after going to a good school, then what next? After being there throughout the week, then what next? That's what Jesus was asking this church. You are in this flourishing city. You think you have everything. But because you're identifying with the world, you have become not enthusiastic about the matters of the kingdom of God. You people are miserable even though you think you have gold. You people are blind even though you think you can see. You people are poor even though you think that your city is flourishing. And you know, when God looks at us, he looks at us when we sometimes identify even as we say as young people today. Some young people today, you, whatever they share, especially in this era of IT, you look at their Facebook pages, they are there to really see. Okay, I just shared a word. But then they will share something else that the likes are like this. And they are like, oh yeah, this is what I need to be sharing tomorrow. Because I shared the word, nobody liked it, or two or three. Sometimes it is zero liking. Sometimes you share a sermon thinking that your Facebook friends, we're going to look at it and say, oh, sister, that I was so blessed. You are like, nobody among all 200 friends looked at this one. But when we want to share something about this or about the other and they like it, that's what we want to share tomorrow, isn't it? Because especially they're identifying with the world. You know, let me tell you something. You share the gospel and so many people may not like it. Share about losing weight. Tell me how many likes you're going to find. Because we are all, we are all getting concerned about our flesh, you know. You know, those are the things we want to talk about, isn't it? Yeah, because we feel good. Hello, can I tell you? Yesterday we had men here talking about Christian service. If, if our brother Luca talks about investment, come and I show you how to make money. Brother Luca, you can bear me witness. Men will come. They will be there. It is something he has experienced. And I do bear witness that the pastors in this church bear witness to the same, isn't it? Yeah, you know, there are things that we just want about the world. Tell your children about getting to Sunday school. You know, they really bothered us in the course of the week. To Naenda Fande, Wapi Gof. 
We try to tell them you are raising money for the sanctuary. That's not an idea they want. Forget about raising money sanctuary. Tunaenda fundi. You try to allow them to know that they are part of a process. Uh -uh. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear about funding. So when you have something, so allow me to go quick. God, in the eyes of the world, has not positioned you to be seen as a master, but as a slave. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.14, But thanks be to God, who always lead us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. You know what? We want the world to see us as masters, but the scripture has positioned the church as captive of Christian, captives and of in Christ, triumphal procession. So as the world sees the triumphant Christ, they see us as captives, but the Bible says this, and we spread the aroma and the knowledge of him everywhere. You know, how many times do you, people talk to you, ah, unajua ni mkristo, nita kukanyanga tena na tena kwa sababu hautajibu. Yes, that's how you should be, by the way. The world need to see you as a slave, not as a master. But again, you find that in the spiritually positioned place, God positioned you as a king. But in the light and the sight of the world, God positions you as a slave. And tells you serve. And tells you bring effect. Now, what then do we have to do with apathy? With all these things and we feel that we are good as we have given examples. Sometimes you find that even our children, they can go through a challenge and they pray. But sometimes they can go through a challenge and remember they have parents with them. Sometimes in school, things happen. You know, when you're getting them out of school, but you get opportunities to show them it, you must become the light of the world. Not, the, you, not, not, just, not just enjoy the danger of apathy as I take you to what do we need to do about it makes us despise worship or godly things. Because the world is not looking at it in an effective manner. Because we are again not enthusiastic about the things of God. We look with the, in the, in, with the things of God, we despise, we despise them. And the Bible says that uh, there was this time that uh, you can get this from, uh, from John 12. And in John 12, the Bible notes that there was a time for Jesus to go to be crucified. And six days before Passover started, Mary, a sister to Lazarus, anointed Jesus' body for crucifixion. But the Bible says, when Judah saw that, he said, and the Bible says, he said that he who betrayed Jesus, and because he was a thief, the Bible says, he said, what a waste. This oil would have been sold for 300 denarii to feed the poor. But what did Jesus say? Uh-huh you will always have the poor among you. But the record of this woman will always be remembered. Because, you know, he despised. He was not having enthusiasm. And the Bible says he had already purposed to betray Jesus. And so he was saying this because he also was a thief he used to get from the coffers. And the Bible notes immediately after, it's when he went to betray Jesus. His thoughts and his focus were on the things of the world. But because he was the treasurer, he was very much respected. He was very much honored. In fact, that's why he would say, in my department, he ni akufidi nani? Poor people. Hello? He wasn't like other Peter and other people. Because he was in that positioning. But the Bible says, Jesus said, you don't know where I'm headed. You will always have the poor among you by the way Judas. Those one you'll always have. But this one has anointed me. How sometimes when you talk about we are not enthusiasm for the things of God. Allow me to give you an example given in the morning. That sometimes we have some churches that are not as beautiful as these ones. In fact, we have some churches within our convention that don't have as much of drum set, as much of this, you know. 
and, and, and then we tell you, especially now the men and the women, you, you're starting to visit those churches. I'm just giving an example. And you walk in and you're like, we are going to sing. Now, how do we worship? Huku wakuna keyboard? Ataka drum set? Unajua tumezoea? Pastor John akipiga keyboard? When we go with the mindset of the things of the world, we despise who God is. But you can just walk in there and sing a song with nothing. And the presence of the Lord does what? Falls down. Even, even when you're looking for places to go for vacation. Munaangalianga mpaka munapigiwa picha. Ipu pika chini ya bed. You know, give me the photo for chini ya bed. Because you're concerned about the kind of presentation. But when it comes to the things of God, we need to see the things of God as you want to see them. So what makes us get out of apathy? Share the message of righteousness to the world. And the Bible says this. This is what the church of Laodicea was unable to do. They were not able to talk about righteousness. They were part of the world. They were not able to say who Christ was. And now that's why God in the second portion, he tells them, then you people buy gold from me. That has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Buy white garments from me. And you will not be shamed by your nakedness. Buy ointment for your eyes. Then you can be able to see. Hallelujah. You cannot lead people to where you are not seeing. So God said you need to change. And realize the spiritual. Earthly spiritually positioned person. Now I am in that part. Now this person talks about buy gold. Garments, nakedness, ointment. And again, there is something that uh, God brings right here. And Christ says, and look, if you open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together as friends. Or some other translation say, we are going to dwell together as friends. Now, all these things that God mentioned, gold, white garments, ointment, were all part of what was stored in the tabernacle. Because they meant the presence of God. Now God says, I will personally come and dwell with you. Now over here, the Bible is talking about righteousness and talks about the tabernacle. That's what God was basically saying. I'll only give you an example in the scripture. But in, 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 in Romans 3, 21 and 22, the Bible says, but, but now apart from the law, God's righteousness is revealed and is attested by the law and the prophets. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So this righteousness has been attested by the law and by the prophets. In Transfiguration, Matthew 17, I'm not going to read. But the Bible says that when the disciples were together, Matthew 17 from 1, and... God and Akina Peter and the apostles, were, the apostles were together. The Bible says as they looked up in the Christ transfiguration, they saw, they, they were able to see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, Moses, in the law and in the Jewish custom and the teaching, represents the law. Elijah represents the prophet, the people who brought in the message. Any time the people were not able to keep the law, what did God do? He raised a messenger. He raised prophets. He raised judges. From the law, he would raise them, the prophets. So these people represent the law and represent the message, the prophets. And now they were having a conversation with Jesus. But then Peter, because he was enthusiastic about things of God in many times, Peter says, oh Jesus, we want to build a tabernacle. Some, translation, some translations say shelter. We want to build a shelter for the three of you. And the Bible says the cloud comes before he finishes to say that. And, they, and the voice comes from heaven and says, this one is the one I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when they were just falling down because of the voice... The Bible says when they opened their eyes, they only saw Jesus. Two, number two, the Bible says, the Bible did not say, these three, I am well pleased, listen to them. He says, this one who has been attested by the law and by the prophets, only that one, Christ only. 
Praise be to the name of the living God. You know, when we just look at Christ, we know our positioning. When we as young people, when we as children, just learn how to know God, just learn how to understand Christ, and we represent him, we're going to do it proudly. Some of our children, even in the Sunday school, the teachers can say how they come and share their stories. Oh, I told some people to pray. You know, but then you're like, that's no good. But you know, you need to tell them, continue to tell them, let's pray. Praise be to the name of the living God. Because when they are swimming lessons and they don't go to the, to, to the end, what do we tell them? You can do it again. Hallelujah. But when it comes to being enthusiastic for the things of God, we are telling them, that's not so good. I'll pray for you. Tell them even tomorrow. If they say again, tell them let us pray. Bonus if you were sana. Because the things of the world tell us you cannot give up. But the things of God, we ought not to give up about them. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that Christ came in greater and became more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. So when God says, I am coming to dwell with you, he says, my presence will be with you. And whenever my presence is with you, apathy will not be a portion. You will be the one who is seeing. You will be having gold. You are not going to be ashamed anymore. But you know right now, anybody want to abuse a church, anybody want to abuse a believer, they just do it. Because when we go to the world, we are arguing with them. We are telling them the same things. I watched an interview of someone who was saying that the church has slept. The church is not telling the government to build schools. The church is not saying. And I said, you know what? That is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to tell the leaders, we want a pastor in that church, in that school you are building. So you put up the school. But you know what? Oh, when they build, we also tell them uh, to Memaliza Community Project. The church has to be heard. The leaders of a nation, they read books. The economy says which way to go. We cannot be sitting again with the same leaders and tell them the same thing. Even if you're going to mention them, we must also represent Christ right there. Bonus if you were sana. And so you are the perfect tabernacle. You, you, God is Christ is the perfect tabernacle, tabernacle coming to dwell with you. And you have his presence. That's why he said, when you get this gold, when you get the white garments, when you get the ointment, you are all that the world wants. Come and buy from me. He wasn't telling them because you have money. He was basically come and see the value because Christ has already become. The price for your righteousness. Bonus if you were sana. In the final part is when God is looking at you, and when you get into these things and dine and together with God, and you are enthusiastic, apathy has been taken away by the message of righteousness. Now God takes you to the kingdom position. The Bible says here: Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And I will share a meal together as friends. New Living Translation. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat with my father on the throne. You know, when you read the scripture, after God, after Christ finished the work, talks about I am seated on the throne. I am seated on the throne. Mainly scriptures. But there is this portion that the Bible says and Stephen said and can see the son of man standing. Christ stands to receive you. But because he finished the work, he sits. He sits. Bonus if you were sana. Some of you, mumelea watoto, wameanza kuchukua biashara zenu, what do you do? Do you keep running there every morning, bona kikuvi? Do you? What do you do at home? Sit. Let them take charge. Hello? When you are victorious, the Bible says that you don't actually start getting struggling. You sit on the throne with Christ. That's what he said. He takes you to the kingdom position. The moment you become righteousness of Christ here on earth, in the kingdom of heaven, Christ is telling you we are together, not standing, seated, finished job. So when we want the world to see us as masters, uh -uh, let the world see us as captives of Christ. Because the Bible says through that procession, we become the fragrance to, 
Talk about his knowledge. That's who we are. And so victory comes out of this conviction. You are able to overcome apathy when you say, this is the right thing and I will do it. Some of us keep traffic rules because the policemen are around you. Or because it is put there in the constitution. You need to keep the traffic rules because it is kingdom based. God tells you obey, simple. So whether kuna policy ama hakuna, this is the way I should live. That is a kingdom person. A kingdom person says, this is the right faith, I will believe it. Some of us, we hear the faith, we hear the message, but because it's going to destroy our comfort zone, we want to look for a way it can come in, not the way it's supposed to be. A kingdom positioned person says, this is the right faith. And that's why he was telling them, and I will even discipline you so that you can turn away from your indifference. Praise be to the name of the living God. A kingdom-based person, they say, this is the word of God, I must believe it. We struggle. This flesh will struggle with the word of God. But a kingdom-positioned person, they have to say, this is the word of God. The throne of God is at your disposal. Our children, our young people, we men and women as well, we must be kingdom positioned people because Christ says, I will dine with you and you're going to sit on the throne while you are victorious. Victory will not come by us getting entangled in the things of the world. Victory will come by us being enthusiastic, passionate, committed to the things of God. Even when the world is speaking opposite, that's what God wants us to do. The danger of apathy is that it takes our light from the society away. When, when, when we let go of the things of God, we become poor. We may be rich in terms of the earthly position, but we are not even able to say a word. We are not able to do what God wants us to do. Praise be to the name of the living God. And so let us just realize that God says, come to me and get the gold, get the righteousness, white garments. Come and get me, I'm the righteousness of God. Now, when I take you back to the righteousness as I kindly ask the worship team to come. In the transfiguration, when God talks about sitting on the throne and now allowing you to be there, the Bible says that this also represents the return of Christ and the positioning of them who had died and the positioning of them that are alive. And that's why he says, the dead will rise up first. That is Moses. But the Elijah, the prophets living, as witnessing, as sharing the message, the Bible says we shall all be caught up in the clouds. With who? With Jesus. That's your spiritual positioning. And you have to just overcome. Our young people, our children, you have to hear. I see it in the morning when I tell them, put Bible story. Wakiwatch moja wananok mlango. Dad, I have finished. I said watch Bible stories. I didn't say one. They go watch a second one. Dad, I have finished. Wambia waweke katun. Iyo nyumba itanyamaza for the next one hour. But the things of God, they also have to struggle with them. They must declare a position. Our children must declare, tell them about katun, baby shark, tuturu, 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 they're going to sing that song. It's already running in their head. Tell them to sing, I worship you, Lord. They will tell you, I don't remember. Tell them to say the memory verse they did yesterday night. I tell them in the morning, what is the memory verse? They start scratching their head. I tell them, sing for Nehema a song, Wema a song, baby shark, you know. They don't struggle with it. You know what? The things of the world, we don't struggle with them. Because we are already there. And that's why this church was comfortable. They were fine. They were flourishing. They were good. They thought they were effective. But when it came to the kingdom of heaven, God was saying, you are seated in a flourishing church. You are seated in a flourishing family. You are seated in a flourishing country. But in the kingdom of God, you are doing nothing. And so arise and get enthusiastic about the things of God. I will kindly ask you to rise up and we sing this song.